about Darwin and uh, when and how he presented his case on evolution. Um, before Darwin uh, presented his case on the theory of evolution, he really made sure that he worked out all the main points of natural selection. You know, he used other scientists' ideas, you know, before his time, um, you know, to come up with the theory of evolution. But during his time, uh, it was, you know, quite extreme, the actual thought that organisms could change over time. And so he really wanted to make sure that he worked out all the main points um, before he presented his case. Uh, likewise, he just wanted to gather as much evidence as he could because during this time, uh, evolution was a very radical idea. And eventually, uh, in 1858, he published this book right here. And uh, it's called The Origin of Species. All right, and just to give you guys a time frame, this was in 1858, and he published his book, uh, The Origin of Species. And that really was his, you know, all of his evidence together, and uh, that's how he presented his case. All right, uh, so we know that uh, Charles Darwin talked about evolution, and how does evolution actually occur? Well, this is what's called natural selection, okay? And so there's two main points uh, about when natural selection actually occurs. Right, the first point, uh, what Darwin called was called the struggle for existence, and he said that if more individuals are produced than there are actual resources, then they those individuals must compete to survive. All right, uh, you know, if there's a whole bunch of individuals and there's not a lot of food, well, then those individuals are going to compete with one another to acquire the food. Uh, the space and any other resources. Uh, Darwin also said that uh, evolution, or sorry, natural selection occurs when there's variation and adaptation. All right. Well, we know that there's a natural variation of traits. Uh, that means that if we look, say, at this gazelle over here, uh, this gazelle could be of a light color, while one of another gazelle could be more of a darker color. Right, and what ends up happening is some variations are better than others. All right, so if this gazelle, uh, you know, its its coat color matched the background there, then it'd be easily camouflaged uh, and harder for the uh, cheetah here to spot it. All right, but let's say that uh, the gazelle, the the coloring wasn't very good and it stuck out from the background environment. Well, then it's going to be more likely to fall prey to, say, this cheetah here. Um, also, you can think about speed. Uh, the slower gazelle most likely will not live uh, or survive to pass on its traits. All right. All right. Uh, also, adaptations. All right. So different organisms can adapt to their environment, uh, which ends up benefiting the organism. All right, so first of all, what is an adaptation? Well, it's a characteristic that increases an organism, organism's ability to survive and reproduce. And the key here is that it's a characteristic uh, that allows both the organism or the organism to both survive and to reproduce. Um, some different examples here. Uh, here we have two different snakes that look very similar, uh, and one is uh, very venomous, while the other one is non-venomous. And uh, this one down here is what's known as the king snake. Okay, and the king snake uh, has three different colors on its body: red, black, and yellow. In this picture, that looks kind of white, but it is yellow. Um, and it has the same coloration as this snake up here. Uh, this snake we see has red, black, and yellow, uh, but this snake is known as the coral snake. All right, And the coral snake is actually venomous. Um, 
But what's happened over time is that the king snake uh, adapted or actually, you know, mimicked the coral snake with the same colora uh, coloration, and um, even though it's not venomous, and what happens is that predators actually uh, do not, you know, prey upon the snake because they think it's venomous. And a good way to remember the difference uh, between a king snake and a coral snake, I guess in case you ever come across snakes that have this coloration, is when the red is near the black, so red on black is a friend of Jack. And so this right here is a king snake and he's non-venomous. But when the red is next to the yellow, or red on yellow, kill a fellow. So, of course it's safe never to pick up any type of snake, but if you come across a king or a coral, uh, that's a good way to remember the difference. Uh, also, uh, we think of camouflage as an adaptation. So in this picture here, we have some bark on a tree. And you might be able to barely make out, but there is a lizard right here. So there's his head, and his arm kind of comes out, one arm goes out that way, or leg rather. Another leg out this way, and here's his body. Uh, even I'm having a hard time finding all the parts of the lizard here, but then you can see that his tail comes down this way. All right, so that's camouflage, uh, and that's a great adaptation for organisms, and of course, you know, if you're camouflaging into your environment, uh, you're much more likely to survive and reproduce. Another way organisms can adapt uh, is actually by uh, growing uh, body parts or structures uh, that may intimidate other organisms. And so this lizard here actually when he feels he or she feels intimidated will flare out this flap and this of course makes the lizard look much bigger uh, than they actually are and so this can intimidate uh, you know a predator and then hopefully he uh, survives the rest of the day um, speaking of survival uh, survival of the fittest and uh, <clears throat> when we think about survival of the fittest there's a term that comes up and this term is called fitness and fitness describes how well an organism can survive and reproduce in its environment. Okay, so quite often a lot of people think, oh, survival of the fittest, it's an organism that's more fit. Say like uh, just a stronger organism. And it's, it's not that. Survival of the fittest means that an organism uh, is able to survive and reproduce, so able to pass on uh, their genes. And different organisms have different levels of fitness. And we usually call that, you know, an organism that is adapted to its environment, it survives and it reproduces very well. We say that organism has a high fitness. And then an organism that does not do well in its environment, uh, you know, which can often lead to extinction, uh, will end up having what's called a low fitness. All right, so continuing on with natural selection, um, <clears throat> just the definition of natural selection located here is the process where an organism uh, or where organisms with variations, so that means they have, you know, uh, we've talked about different colors of eyes or something like that, so they have a variation of a trait, um, best suited to the environment, survive and reproduce, uh, or sorry, survive and produce offspring. And uh, when does natural selection occur? It occurs, once again, where more individuals are born than can survive. Um, it also needs to occur when there's variation of traits and where there's variable fitness. Right? So you could break that down into three. So it's where more individuals are born than can survive. Right? There also needs to be variation of traits. So those organisms that are surviving, they need to have a variation of whatever the trait is, and there also needs to be variable fitness. And it's a good thing to remember that natural selection does not make organisms better. Okay, natural selection just makes organisms good enough to survive and reproduce. Uh, and the example that we could look at uh, are these two different types of flowers. Right, so this tree right here has developed, uh, you know, these long kind of skinny um, beads of flowers that come out. And, you know, this works for this tree. Uh, down here, I believe we have an apple tree. And uh, the apple tree has evolved these type of flowers. 
Now both of these types of flowers here um, work for the, the actual organism. And so it's, it's good to remember that natural selection does not make organisms better. It just makes them good enough to survive. Uh, and today the last thing we'll leave off is what's called um, common descent. And uh, really what common descent means is that every organism that's alive today, or what's called modern, modern organisms, is an offspring of previous generations. And uh, the, these current organisms actually descend with, with modifications, so they change over time. And um, <clears throat> kind of to summarize, all, of, or, sorry, all species, whether they're living, so they're actually on Earth right now, or they're extinct, are descended from a common ancestor. And I decided to include uh, this picture right here, which is uh, the first ever, um, I guess, evolutionary tree uh, drawn. And this was drawn by Darwin. And you can see up here, uh, this was actually part of his, uh, you know, his journal that he kept when he was on the Beagle. And up here he wrote the uh, two words, I think. And so what he did is he drew this evolutionary tree and, you know, he was saying that pretty much some kind of common ancestor or, you know, uh, you know, very far in the past started here and then over time different branches occurred where organisms uh, evolved in a different direction. Okay, and so this right here is uh, Darwin's Tree of Life and uh, it just shows that all these species, so species here, 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 so all the species are located at the end, right? And obviously if we drew one right now for all the organisms, um, it'd be uh, uh, quite the tree. This is obviously a very simple tree and only has maybe about 10 organisms, but all these organisms located at the end of these branches are, if you trace them back, are related to one common ancestor.